afternoon and welcome. I am Erica Meltzer, Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Colorado, and thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you who aren't yet familiar with Chalkbeat, we are a nonprofit news organization dedicated to one topic, and that's education, with a special focus on the students who are least well served by our current system. You can find us um, online at chalkbeat.org. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletters. Uh, we send out a daily newsletter uh, Monday through Friday, as well as uh, special newsletters on early childhood education um, and higher education. Um, we'll be tweeting this event at hashtag CoLedge2022. Please feel free to join along there. Uh, during this event, the chat box will be closed. Uh, please submit your audience questions via the Q&A function. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can also let us know in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to, um, to help you out there. I wanna give a special thanks to our event partner, the Mortgage College of Education at the University of Denver, and a special thanks to our event sponsor, the Colorado Education Association. And I know um, everyone is incredibly busy. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. When we gathered a year ago, we really thought we were in the thick of it then, and we just heard from so many people that in some ways this year is harder than ever, and we're thankful to our panelists to talk about just the incredibly critical issues facing our education system today. And then for opening remarks, I would like to introduce Ryan Gildersleeve, Associate Dean um, at the University of Denver. Thank you, Erica, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining the Mortgage College of Education at University of Denver and Chalkbeat Colorado for this 2022 legislative preview. I'm Ryan Evely Gildersleeve, and I serve as an associate dean here in our college. Our partnership with Chalkbeat reflects our mission and values to produce actionable knowledge that impacts education. We are especially grateful for Chalkbeat Colorado's efforts year round as they provide an important nonpartisan examination of education in Colorado in real time. The high quality journalism produced by Chalkbeat Colorado contributes to a dynamic ecosystem of knowledge for and about education. The Mortgage College of Education at University of Denver also contributes to this ecosystem. The research our faculty does informs systemic practice and policy in longer term examinations, so as to better structure education for more equitable access, success, and outcomes. Our students enroll in academic programs to pursue knowledge about leading in a dynamic education environment. And the outreach efforts of our faculty, staff, and students combined <clears throat> excuse me, engage communities in knowledge building and action taking that helps complete the educational knowledge ecosystem. The action piece to our work is significant. Indeed, our current strategic plan includes a think and action ethic that requires on the ground and in the moment coverage that Chalkbeat Colorado provides as a foundation to the longer term scholarship and evidence that our researchers and students build upon when engaging communities in taking action for greater educational equity and more robust and powerful learning experiences across our state. Education today faces so many challenges and our challenges seem to shape shift right before our eyes as the COVID-19 pandemic persists and economic inequality widens and our social institutions wrestle with our role in pervasively racialized inequities. Understanding real-time and longer-term evidence of how our policy and practice entwine to produce educational experiences and outcomes across our state is imperative for our community to participate meaningfully and effectively particularly in relationship to new law and policy emerging in these turbulent times. And so it is with great pride and excitement that I welcome our partners from Chalkbeat Colorado to facilitate today's legislative preview. I'm now turning it over to Chalkbeat reporter Jason Gonzalez to kick us off. Jason? 
Ryan, Erica, thank you so much for the introductions. Um, I am Jason Gonzalez, higher education reporter for Track Beat Colorado. I also cover legislative matters with Erica and really excited for the panel today and introducing the panelists. But first, let me introduce you to my co-moderator, Olivia. Hello, my name is Olivia. I'm a senior at DSST Conservatory Green. Um, and I'm also a member of the Colorado Youth Congress. I've been an intern with them for the past four years, and this year will unfortunately be my last year. Um, other than CYC though, I'm very passionate about black history and education. Um, so reading books and articles fills most of my time. And I'll pass it back to Jason. Thank you so much, Olivia. Now let's introduce you all to the panelists. Um, First, Senator Rachel Zenzinger, Senate Education Committee Chair, Senator Paul Lundeen, Senate Education Committee, Senate Janet Buckner, Senate Education Committee, Representative Barbara McLaughlin, House Education Committee Chair, and Representative Colin Larson, uh, House Education Committee, and he will be a little bit late, so he'll join us um, through this. So thank you everyone for joining us, and let's see everybody's... Uh, on. So we'll get started here. Um, first, I'd like to ask a question of uh, Senator Zenzinger and Senator Lundeen. Uh, several of you are on the school finance com interim committee now in its fourth year. What changes will we see to school funding this session and how will that make a difference for students? Well, thank you so much for having me. Again, I'm State Senator Rachel Zenzinger. I represent Senate District 19, which is Arvada and Westminster, all in Jefferson County. And I do serve as the State Senate Chair of Education. And I am also a member of the School Finance Interim Committee, as are several other members uh, that are on this call, including uh, my colleague, Senator Lindine, and my colleague, uh, Rep Larson. Um, I'm really excited about uh, some of the bills that we're going to be bringing forward this year uh, that have the real potential to be transformational as far as the types of educational supports that we provide our students. Uh, the biggie for me, the one that I am probably most passionate about is um, the work that we're doing around special education. Uh, currently, uh, we have some fixed allocations for special education. Uh, they're not in our School Finance Act, but they are a part of our categorical spending for uh, students. And right now we're not meeting those expectations that we have already predetermined. We created a framework for supporting and funding special education back in 2006. And we have only gotten to about 50% of that um, since 2006. So uh, the first and foremost, I'm really looking forward to some changes that we're proposing uh, to fully fund special education. Um, there's a couple of other components um, that I want to allow my other colleagues to, to speak to, um, including some work that we're doing around at-risk funding. And with that, I'll just turn it over to Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the question. Jason, Olivia, look forward to your moderation of this event. Thanks for being here. Uh, Dean Gildersleeve, thanks for your introductory remarks and your sponsorship of this ongoing conversation. Um, there are a couple of other bills that uh, the committee, the interim committee, school finance committee, will discuss and vote on as we get into the legislative session. We haven't pushed any of them forward yet. But one of the additional things that I continue to hang on to, because I am an eternal optimist, um, when you're an entrepreneur, as I am, 10 small companies over the last 30 years, when you're a former member of the State Board of Education and you realize that the way we've fund schools, the way we choose to flow the money makes a fundamental difference in the policy of education and therefore makes a fundamental difference in the way students receive service and attain or don't attain academic achievement. The conversation around fixing and improving that formula always lives present in your mind as it does in mine. And I am hopeful, continuously hopeful, the eternal optimist that because of the flexibility we have right now with all this massive amount of money that is now floating around in our system, we have almost $6 billion in excess money floating around in the state budget. Three, half of that's uh, federal ARPA money, half of that's money that we over, have over collected based on prior budget choices. Um, but that $6 billion gives us an opportunity to truly lean into 
finding flexibility in how we choose to fund education. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing. There seems to be a live conversation and desire to move forward into creating more flexibility in what we do with the funds that we have and more flexibility in how we change that formula. Um, to Senator Zinziger's point, um, special education is one of the issues that will be dealt with at risk and changing the way we look at at risk is an open conversation right now. There is a, a strong leaning towards looking at economic issues and economic challenge as a fundamental part of at risk. I'm one who continue, continues to argue there are other elements we should also consider with regard to uh, causing a child to be at risk um, and, um, as well as economic issues. Um, but I'll pause at that point and give, give uh, rep. Uh, Larson an opportunity since he also serves on the committee to take a bite at that uh, apple the question about the interim school finance committee meeting. I don't know whether you heard Colin or not, but that's that's the subject we're chewing on at the moment. No, absolutely. And uh, thank you, Senator Zenzinger, Senator Lundeen, and thank you for Chalkbeat and um, you know all of the sponsors. This is my favorite event uh, of the year, and that is no BS. Uh, I have scrambled yes, my Matt schedule Jones. around to make sure I can <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I have a uh, very mixed feelings about um, the Senate Finance Committee. Sorry, the School Interim Finance Committee. Uh, on the one hand, I think I came into this with a little more doe-eyed optimism than perhaps I should have, because I thought that uh, this year was going to be the year that we updated the antiquated formula uh, and actually made it student-centered. Um, I don't think these are new things that we talked about, but district or the characteristics of the district funding them based on things like, you know, the number of students that are learning languages, the number of students that are gifted and talented, the number of students that are on uh, IEPs and these sorts of things, much more student centric model. Um, thought we were going to do that. It does not look like we are going to accomplish that. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, I am thrilled about some of the, the legislation that will come out, particularly the um, special education bill that Senator Zenzinger referenced, uh, which is something that I think is near and dear to both of our hearts. Uh, Rachel, or Senator Zenzinger has been carrying that torch a lot longer than I have, uh, but I share her enthusiasm for that particular community. Um, and then the, the bill to redo our definition of at risk, make it something that uh, I think is a little bit more uh, two-dimensional than, than simply free and reduced price lunch. Um, so I think there's gonna be some good progress there. Uh, those are the two bills. Uh, I think we may see one or two others coming out, uh, one that may not have unanimous uh, support, but I think at least three of the four bills uh, will probably have a them. And, and again, is it going to be the, uh, the, the grass ring of redoing the formula that I think we all really wanted to do? No, but I do think they're gonna be important steps forward for our state. So uh, excited to see how that comes in the upcoming session. And Jason, I just want to throw out uh, that the interim committee is a two-year committee, so we're not done. Uh, this was our first stab, and I think that the things that we've chosen to focus on are items that we actually made some adjustments to last year in last year's school finance formula. And so we picked them up and we decided let's, let's keep moving that ball down, down the field, uh, but we're not done. So we haven't scored that touchdown and uh, there is still more work to, to be done and uh, to be had and I think we will. And there's also one more bill as I understand or uh, about um, mill levies. So I wanted to see if uh, how that would be received from, from uh, the different parties and see what your thoughts are on that. And then uh, Representative Larson just no, we're getting a little bit of uh, choppiness for me. So it's just, uh, if, if you want to, you know, I'm not sure if you can make an adjustment or not, but just wanted to say, you know, make you aware of that. I will try. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in and start with your question with regard to the, the mill levy question. Um, it's actually not the mill levy, it's mill levy override. So um, there is a little bit of a distinction. Um, I uh, was really pleased to be able to tackle the mill levy equalization effort last year. Um, but this is this is looking at the inequities that have sprung up um, in, in individual communities based on their property wealth. And if there is a community uh, that wants to go to their voters and their voters are inclined to give them permission 
for a mill levy override, uh, the power of that mill levy override is just very different depending on where you live. And, um, and because of that, many communities, um, some of which in reaction to the budget stabilization factor have chosen to pursue a mill levy override. But um, if you look at the differences um, in one Senate district, um, uh, Senator Bridges likes to bring this up as a good example, uh, Cherry Creek School District went for a mill levy override and it netted a certain amount based on the property wealth versus Sheridan School District, uh, who could have also gotten the same permission from their voters to do a mill levy override, but it just, it, 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 it netted, you know, next to nothing, um, and that's because of the makeup of of the property property wealth and the way that we assess property um, currently. So um, nobody made the decision to get us to the point where we are today. Uh, it's just happened over a, a period of years, a confluence of of uh, different types of laws that have been on the books that have been interacting with one another. Um, the former Gallagher Amendment with Tabor and so on, and and so just over time we have these gross inequities that have sprung up and um and so there is a bill there's a proposal to to provide a, a small incentive uh program, uh, a little bit of matching money to these communities that are at the lowest end of the spectrum. So it wouldn't be available to all school districts, but um, it would be available to those. Um, I, I think there's approximately 15 school districts that are just right down there at the very bottom of the spectrum. And it's still voter choice. So they would still have to go to their voters and their voters would still have to approve it. Uh, but if they did, um, the state would come in with some matching money in order to be able to maximize that investment that the voters want to make in their community. Um, I'd be happy to chime in on that as well. <clears throat> this is one of the wrinkles that we have in the uh, existing finance formula. Um, there, there are several wrinkles. Um, this is, uh, you know, that, that aren't fundamental to, to the, the point of uh, Rep uh, Larson earlier. There is a big lift, a heavy lift that needs to be made to completely re-envision how we fund our system to make it more about students and less about the system itself. Um, if we truly care to get beyond the 50% success ratio we seem to be having now. But this is one of those wrinkles as we move towards that big lift, we can iron out some of these problems. And, and I would argue that there are a number and that if we choose to iron one out, we ought to iron them all out. For instance, um, a few years back, the House passed or the, the General Assembly passed 1375, which said that all charter school institute authorized students should be funded at the same level as the other students in a district. For instance, specifically in Aurora, Two students living in the same household, if one attends a charter school institute school and the other attends a neighborhood school, the neighborhood school child is being funded at a higher level. We need to iron that wrinkle out as well. And so if we choose to resolve this MLO issue, this MLO override issue, we should also, in my opinion, iron out some of these other things and quite frankly, obey the law 1375 that says charter school institute students deserve the same funding as all the other students in that district. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin, Senator Lundeen, and Representative Larson for those insightful and thoughtful answers. Um, I would like to ask this next question to Representative McLaughlin and Representative Larson um, and, represent, and Senator Lundeen. With the recent rise in COVID cases and new variants, schools are shutting down again. Over the last two years, we've seen school closures disproportionately affect students in low income or minority communities. What programs or policies could legislation create to ensure learning loss doesn't happen even more? Um, I'll go first if you need. Um, really great question. And uh, first of all, thank you to everybody for um, having us all on board today. This is always an interesting discussion and uh, I love talking education. Um, I'm Barbara McLaughlin and I represent House District 59. I live in Durango and I represent six counties in Southwest Colorado, um, nine school districts. And um, I was a teacher for 20 years at Durango High School. So um, I kind of know, um, I understand when teachers are saying, 
we need this or we want this or what about this because I've been there and I've asked those same questions. So um, I think what teachers did and students did during this pandemic so far is nothing short of miraculous in some cases. And I think we need to, um, you know, they had to completely switch everything they were doing, every kind of teaching. You couldn't do group things anymore. You couldn't do um, discussions anymore. If people turned off their cameras, you know, you couldn't do all this stuff that um, I found so important for schools, um, just for education in general. So I think we need to, to keep moving forward. I think uh, when we've left it up to schools to decide if in their situation, they need to either close down, wear masks, um, do something. I think that's been pretty helpful. I think instead of having a, a, state, a statewide um, rule for what they should be doing. I think we need to get communities to um, help our students and to encourage them and to, um, you know, if they need tutoring, if they need help, let's give them calls, let's give them the help that they need. It's really, really difficult for a kid to be sitting at home at the kitchen table and trying to do classwork when they're so used to having um, a question and answer if the teacher's walking by to do something. Um, so I think we need to, I'm not sure we're doing anything wrong right now. I think we just need to tweak it and make um, everything that we've tried to do better um, as we move through this. It's a very, there's no guidebook for this. And uh, every school is kind of writing their own guidebook and their own rules. And in some cases it's working really well. And if they have the um, materials to do it with like broadband or computer, something like that, um, then I think we just need to keep carrying on and be safe, keep each other safe and healthy and um, hope that schools uh, recover in many ways from this. Um, not a real solution, but um, a suggestion perhaps. <laughs> Um, I'd be happy to jump in. Olivia, I think you've hit on one of the biggest questions um, that, that was present prior to the COVID pandemic, and it has become crystal clear during the COVID pandemic. Um, a year ago, when we thought we were in the middle, and now it looks like we were maybe in the front third, I don't know, of, of the pandemic and the negative impact it's having on our schools and on our children, um, I offered up Senate Bill 37 which said many parents um, of the more than 30,000 students that had opted out of public education, many parents found solutions. They, they put their kid in a learning pod, they hired a tutor, they did what their child needed in order for their child to, to advance. But the reality is families of challenged economic means who couldn't afford a tutor, who couldn't afford to organize into a pod, they didn't have the money to do that. And so I ran Senate Bill 37, which would have given $4,000 to each family that said, you know what, in order to deal with this COVID crisis, we need some support. And it would have given greater, it would have given a nod to the equity piece that is missing in public education, especially during the pandemic. Senate Bill 37 died, unfortunately, in its first committee. This year, we have an enormous opportunity, as I already mentioned. We have significant dollars floating around. And the Colorado Sun is going to release a, an article later today describing a bill that, uh, that I will bring along with Senator Barb Kirkmeyer that will eliminate the budget stabilization factor and call on the districts to provide flexibility to give parents, specifically those parents of economic challenge, an opportunity to do what they know needs to happen for the benefit of their chi child. Uh, Chair McLaughlin is absolutely correct. The districts have been working diligently, hard. They have been sweating blood trying to help our children out. And parents also have been writing a new guidebook because they know better than anyone else what needs to happen on behalf of their child. And so we are going to offer up a piece of legislation this session. Um, it'll, it's my pre-filed bill. It'll become public uh, Wednesday, Thursday, as soon as it, it is released across the desk in the Senate. That would pay down, pay off the budget stabilization factor and ask for greater flexibility so that we can in fact deal with the exact question, the exact problem, the exact crisis you put your finger on, Olivia. It's a, it's a meaningful, important issue and we need to do something about it. Thank you so much, Senator Lundeen and Representative McLaughlin for your answers. Um, for this next question, it's from the audience and it's for Representative McLaughlin and Representative Larson. 
what kinds of mental health programs slash resources will be provided for students and staff for this coming school year? Is Larson on here? I don't see him anymore. He must have disappeared. <laughs> um, we already have um, free um, online counseling for um, educators. Um, it's, um, you can get it online and it's telehealth. And uh, we put that into uh, one of our bills last year. So we think, um, we hope it's being used widely. Um, I know when I told the teachers in my district about it, they were very excited to have um, the opportunity and that somebody recognized it. Um, they too were having a, a difficult time. Um, with schools, we have, we've been putting a lot of uh, money and energy and time into, um, into getting more mental health care for students. We understand um, just how awful it's been for many students. Uh, we know suicide rates are going up. Um, you know, they're just, they're struggling. They don't have, um, I think everybody thinks school is education, but a lot of times it's just being with your peers and having somebody care about you and having a teacher say good morning to you when you come in the door. Um, it's not necessarily about if you can put the commas in the right place. It's, um, there's a lot more social aspect to school and I think it's been really hard. So we are working on putting money and energy and um, counselors into buildings and access to counseling for um, both teachers and students. And I think, um, you know, we're working hard at whatever we do, it probably won't be enough, but we are working hard to do more and more and more all the time. Senator Lundin, if you want to, if you have anything to add and uh, represent Larson said, all right. Um, so we'll move on to a question for Senator Buckner. Um, so Colorado is rolling out an ambitious universal preschool program. How can the legislator make sure this program is successful and that it reaches the families who need it the most? Well, good morning. No, it's afternoon now. <laughs> Hi. I, I always look forward to this legislative preview with Chalkbeat. We appreciate all the work you do, Chalkbeat, to get the word out there. And Olivia, I am so proud of you. And I'm so excited. I can't believe you are a senior, but thank you for being a part of these education talks. It's really, really appreciated. Um, I just want to give you a little background real fast. Um, I've been in the legislature since 2015, and I love education. In my former life, I was a speech pathologist with an endorsement in special education and language development. And when I was a teacher, I used to, pre, I used to screen all of the pre-K kids and the kindergarten kids. And boy, did I get a great overview of what those young people could do as far as language development. And they were like little sponges and they wanted to learn so much. So fortunately this year, I am a part of this new universal preschool that we're going to have, and it's really exciting. As a mother and a grandmother, I know how important early childhood is, and it's one of the best investments we can make. Um, I was a proud sponsor of House Bill 21-1304 last session, and that created the new Department of Early Childhood to help streamline our existing programs and make them easier for parents and um, providers to navigate. One of the biggest complaints we heard during this process was the fact that it wasn't easy to find out what you needed to find out. So that was one of the catalysts for developing this new Department of Early Childhood. This new department will also house the new universal preschool program that Colorado's voted for by a two thirds margin so I, I am really excited. Um, this summer, the Early Childhood Leadership Commission led a comprehensive stakeholder process with more than 100 meetings and with early childhood professionals, providers, and parents across the, the state to inform the next uh, steps. The other thing I wanna emphasize is there were over a thousand comments from Coloradans, from parents, from everyone about, they were very candid about what is needed. So we took all of that input, put, and I was uh, chairing one of the commissions, uh, the, the early childhood school readiness meetings and the comments and the information we gained were invaluable. 
Some of those, some of the comments were hard to listen to, but we wanted candidacy. We wanted, wanted people to be candid and honest about what they really needed. So it's been, it's been a really interesting process. I also want to commend the Early Childhood Le Leadership Commission, which as you know, is a new commission. And this is a federally authorized state and advisory council, state leaders who are experts, matter experts, subject matter experts and champions. And they uh, gave us two reports. And the first report was unanimously voted on. And guess what? This morning, they passed the second report unanimously. So we are ready to go. We are so excited to get everything going. So when this new legislative session begins, Senator uh, Fenber and I and Representative Sirota and uh, Speaker Garnett will be uh, developing satellite bills so we can get this new universal preschool going. So I'm excited at the opportunity lots of hard work and we are at the beginning of this because universal preschool will not be enacted until 2023 but we have so much work to do but we are on our way um the level of detail in this in these reports is going to give me a lot of reading time but it's really comprehensive but it's worth it's worth the effort and i'm so proud to add my name uh to this project. Senator Lundin, you had your hand up there. I did, I did. Senator Buckner has just given a great overview of all the important things that are happening inside the early childhood education effort. And, and we all know that that is a fundamental um, opportunity to get a child on the right path. You know, if you're not reading by third grade, you're gonna have a struggle the rest of your life. And this is helpful in getting there. The, the question Jason asked is, how, how do we uh, make sure that we get to the students who need it most? And, and I think the key to that lies in the mixed delivery system that we have in early childhood education. It's this plethora of different models and methods of providing service. That's what will get us to make sure that we can get right to. If you've got somebody who's serving in the community and has relationship in the community, then they will in fact be able to have the ability to reach out to and engage those students who need it most, those that we must make sure don't miss out on the opportunity. So I will always be a vigorous defender of mixed delivery and the promotion of an array of different service providers because that is the best way to make sure we get the answer to those who need it most. You know, Senator Lundeen, uh, Senator Lundeen and I have this amazing relationship that we started over in the house. I, I, I just love working with him. And thank you for talking about that mixed delivery system because that is crucial. We just haven't been giving enough support for local infrastructures and uh, supporting our communities. And Senator Lundy, I'm going to be picking your brain this whole session about how we do this and making sure we don't forget anything. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, Senator Buckner, I will participate, but if you're picking my brain, it might be pretty slim pickings. <laughs> no, 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 never. <laughs> well, I'm not a part of the love fest that's going on over there. <laughs> yes, please, I saw um, that. But I will say that, um, you know, I taught high school for a long time and we could tell even at the high school level, uh, which kids were brought up having early childhood education, a really good solid foundation. And um, even if it's something like how to work with people, how to turn in your work on time, how to have manners, how to talk to other people, it was all very evident. So I'm very, very excited about this going through because I think it's, um, education is the foundation of everything we do and to have a really good solid foundation is um, more important than ever. So thank you, um, Senator Buckner for getting this going and everything. And Senator Lundin, thanks for supporting Senator Buckner. She gets this going, so thanks. <laughs> Jason, do you want me to, to keep talking about this? Um, we'll move on. Olivia has a question for you. Okay, thank you. It's wonderful to see you again, uh, Senator Buckner. Uh, this next question is also for you. 
Uh, you withdrew a bill last year to revamp student discipline practices and ban handcuffing children after mounting opposition. This bill was a priority for many advocacy groups and the governor. Will you bring this bill back? If not, what alternative can we expect? Olivia, thank you for that question. The school to prison pipeline bill was really close to my heart very close to my heart as a former educator and my husband was a high, my late husband was a high school principal and we talked about the school to prison pipeline all the time at our dinner table and last last session we had to postpone indefinitely that bill it's really complex on why we had to back off that bill i think there were a lot of misconceptions about what we were really trying to do and i'm going to take the blame for some of the issues we had I think that I am this eternal optimist. And I think that being that eternal optimist, I didn't realize how many uh, problems we were going to approach. And as I said, lots of misunderstanding about what the bill was really about. I believe in school discipline. I also believe that every student needs to be given an opportunity uh, and not be immediately put into the criminal justice system. And I will not, we will not be bringing that bill back this year, even though there has been wide support for bringing it back, we are not going to be bringing it back this year. I think right now with our schools in such turmoil because of the pandemic, I just don't think it's the time this year to bring back that piece of legislation. Um, it's not that it's not important, but I think we have to start the stakeholder process much earlier than we did last time. And I think that the stakeholder process needs to be formulated differently than we did. So I'm the first to say that I don't think it was a mistake, but I will roll it out totally differently if in the future we do decide to uh, uh, have a school discipline bill. Thank you so much, Senator Buckner. You're welcome. Um, we'll move on to a testing question. So uh, the Colorado Board of Education recommended in December to resume full statewide testing and restart accountability ratings. Lawmakers ultimately have the say, so you guys have the say. What's your stance on this recommendation? And uh, we'll go to Senator Zenzinger and then Senator Lundin. Great. Uh, so I have been following that conversation very closely, and I've been working in partnership with the State Board of Education and several of their stakeholders, including Rep. McLaughlin, on a transitional accountability bill, um, a, a bill that would allow us some sort of an interim step as we glide back into our accountability system as, um, as it was. Um, and part of that conversation is assessment. Uh, part of that uh, conversation is the accountability rating system that we have right now, and then of of course, uh, teacher evaluation is also a small component of that. Um, what the State Board of Ed uh, voted on a, a few weeks ago uh, was an acknowledgement, and they voted unanimously, by the way, <laughs> that we do need to transition back to normal, uh, back to our regular accountability system, but that we might need to do it with some grace. Um, and so uh, to the uh, specific um, uh, question around assessments, I do believe that we need to get back into regular order. Uh, um, I did carry a, a bill last year that was a, a huge compromise bill. Um, I, I thank my colleagues for uh, signing on and voting in favor of that, which allowed us to reduce the amount of state testing um, because of, of COVID, because of what was happening um, on the ground at the time of the testing window. Uh, but we were not able to get... Um, uh, from the federal government, a waiver to stop testing. And if we were unable to get a waiver from the federal government during the height of the pandemic, um, I don't see that in the cards uh, for the future. So um, this transitional accountability bill will not touch the assessment component. Um, I, I expect and believe that we will move forward um, uh, like normal. Uh, but as far as the accountability rating system goes, uh, what the State Board of Ed also voted uh, in favor of was for some schools that might there be on the cusp, 
um, uh, is this an appropriate time to put them on the clock? And, and we unanimously, all members of the State Board of Ed agreed, no, this is not the time to start advancing people on the clock. Um, so we are working on a bill that would pause that particular component of the accountability um, structure. <clears throat> Secondly, if you have schools and districts that are on the clock, but have made tremendous success, we don't want to keep them there. So we are also putting some effort into the request for reconsideration to heighten that, to allow districts to come forward uh, with their data, with their, with their story, to be able to say, we've done the work and we think we deserve an opportunity to move off the clock. Um, and so that will also be a part of this um, transitional accountability bill. And then lastly, we want to empower the State Board of Ed uh, to be able to work within the existing system to make um, some, uh, to provide some grace to uh, districts and schools right now, uh, because we are still dealing with the impacts of COVID. Um, and it has uh, been um, just a really difficult two years in education. And I saw a question in the Q&A um, I'm assuming that this is from one of our teachers. If not, I just want to say thank you uh, for reminding um, all of the panelists today that we should be doing more uh, to thanking and congratulating and, and lifting up the good work of our, our schools and districts because truly um, what they have gone through and what they are doing in response to making sure that our, still, our, our children are still educated is nothing short of amazing. Um, I, I remember last year in the height of, pan, of the pandemic when my kids were uh, learning from home, uh, one of my kids' uh, math teachers actually came to our home and delivered a care package of um, goodies, um, uh, all sorts of uh, fun educational um, activities, and, uh, and, and a personal note. Um, just to, to tell my child to hang in there. And that one little effort um, that, that that teacher did made a huge difference in my child's ability to, to make it through the pandemic. My child felt heard and loved and, and was excited about getting on online and doing math <laughs> from home because uh, they knew that they had a teacher that really cared about them on the other end of that screen. So um, I just want to say thank you to all of our, our educators out there that have done a tremendous job. And hopefully this accountability bill that we are um, sponsoring will continue to set us on the right course, get us back to where we need to be, but provide that grace that our schools and districts really need right now. Yeah, Jason, I'll chime in and, and add my voice of thanks and admiration. I'm the grandson, son, husband, and father of educators. They do incredible hard work in the best of times. And boy, we have not been in the best of times over the last couple of years. So my heart and gratitude goes out to all the teachers, all the people who work in the public school system, private schools, any education provider for the work they've done to continue to press forward in that most important element of what we do as a society. And that is help our children become more able to attain the future they deserve and to help our society stay on the track it should be on. Having said that, it's really important that we continue to hold ourselves um, accountable for a great result because that great result is, as I just said, fundamental to who we are as a society and fundamental to who we are as people supporting children to become the best individual they can possibly be. And so to the core question of tests, we started out with the question of assessments. Um, Senator Zenziger spoke about accountability, um, an element of grace in the moment of crisis, absolutely. But we must begin to or keep laying down the information necessary to understand where we are at. And that begins with assessments. Now, are they going to be perfect? Do they get, does every single situation have an asterisk next to it? Absolutely. But we must keep gathering the data so that we know how we are doing, because nothing is more important than that child's education. And if we are failing to deliver on that hope, on that promise of that child's education, we're failing that child and we're failing society. I would just like to add that 
I don't think um, any of us are advocating for getting rid of the tests because we do need that data. It's absolutely, you know, as a teacher, that's how I would get things done was look at the data and um, plan lessons according to that. Um, but we have to be careful about how we use this data that at this point is flawed a bit if you know kids aren't showing up. Um, I'm doing another story, uh, another story. I'm doing another bill with Senator story. Sorry, put the story in there a little early. Um, and this will be a, um, a learning disruption bill. So if the learning has been disrupted, um, the teachers will not be evaluated on their student scores for a year. The, the test will still go on, um, but it's just kind of a timeout so that we're not punishing teachers for something that is far beyond their control. So, um, so we are helping, uh, we're trying to help the teachers with that as well. So, <clears throat> Of course, Colorado has put a lot of effort into proving, improving reading instruction, but in last spring CMAS test, math scores actually dropped. What can you do to make sure um, students are graduating with the math skills they need to be successful in life? Uh, Representative Larson, we, I believe you're back, so we'll start with you on that one. Thank you, I apologize. Having a little trouble hearing you. Apologies, can you hear me better now? Excellent, excellent. Um, well, thank you. Yes, and uh, I apologize for my, my brief interruption there. So uh, this is absolutely something that's been top of mind. And I, I'll let, uh, if a certain other legislator wants to tip her hat, but I will say that I have been working on a bill um, with somebody on this call uh, <laughs> that hopefully we'll be doing together a bipartisan effort to address this very issue. Um, trying to draw on some of the successes that we've seen with the READ Act, and obviously that has been a long and storied history, but um, to look at how that bill has been implemented over the last couple of years and to replicate, and again, it's not gonna be a perfect corollary because you have fundamentally different, uh, first of all, like scientific issues with reading and, and learning disability there, but um, creating a similar type uh, kind of laboratories of education um, an experimentation at the district level policy for mathematics and in mathematics instruction. Um, have been working with stakeholders on that. I think there's a lot of interest and excitement around it and drawing from some of the lessons that we've learned, both the good and the bad with the READ Act uh, and to create a similar kind of district driven grant program to do math innovation with tracking to make sure that, you know, these investments are actually, what are we getting if we're change, making these curriculum um, advancements? are they having an impact on students' math scores? Um, so that's a big piece of legislation I'm working on, very excited about it. Uh, we'll see it probably read over here pretty quickly uh, and I'm hoping it'll be bipartisan. I trust that it will be, um, but, but yes, I mean, because it's, it's, it's just as fundamental as reading in terms of kids being prepared for what comes after school, whether it's going on to college, whether it's going into career and technical education career path, or frankly, just working in retail. I mean, those basic arithmetic skills um, sliding down. So math is fundamental. And the fact that our math scores are, are just in the toilet, it's, it's setting our kids behind. So, um, you know, hopefully there'll be a first bite at the apple. Very excited about that. And hopefully there'll be some other folks working on math related issues as well. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. <laughs> And I'm the, the mystery person on the other side of the aisle here. Um, yeah, I think uh, math and reading are the same but different. And so we need to approach it a little bit differently, but we also need to make sure that the kids are getting um, what they need to move on. Uh, math is a little different because if you don't get one year, you really struggle the next year. Sometimes in English, you can kind of catch up, but math is, um, it's absolutely built on the last year of, of working. Uh, one of my friends at the high school where I used to teach um, so that he's getting math kids in into the high school who do not know um, basic multiplication, subtraction, division. Um, so he's having to start all over in a class that, um, you know, maybe lower level algebra, but it, they don't know, um, you know, basic math skills. So we need to make sure that goes on. So, um, yeah, so Representative Larson and I are working on that and, um, and having the discussion. So, <laughs> yeah, so thanks. This next question is from the audience. What are some of the legislative and policy goals that we might see for Colorado higher education? Um, I would like to start with Representative McLaughlin. Uh, 
Um, yes, I'm, I'm doing a bill with um, Senator Zenzinger right now. And um, it's kind of basic. It, I read it and I thought, huh, why do we need this for a bill? <laughs> but um, what it'll do is um, account for tuition. And uh, Senator Zenzinger, tell me if I get this wrong for you, okay? Um, it accounts that the, um, the tuition that's coming in is part of the general fund for a school. So they can, um, they will have a better credit rating. They will be able to get more money in. They can um, kind of do more with their money. And it seems like kind of a simple thing. Uh, CU does it, but um, every other school in the state only lets 10% of tuition be recognized as um, part of the money available to spend. So this gives every school in Colorado 100% um, on tuition. It doesn't mean they'll spend it on anything, but it just adds more to the pot so that they can, um, they will have a better credit rating and can do more with the dollars they have. Yeah, so. in, in reaction to uh, Moody's uh, recently changed their, their bonding requirements and, and um, universities and colleges have to take on their para liabilities as part of their portfolio. And so um, allowing our colleges and universities to be able to pledge 100% of their tuition revenue, just like CU already does, um, helps balance that out so that our colleges and universities can continue to do capital construction projects and not have that additional para liability be a, a factor in um, their ability to bond or to take out CAPs or, or things along those lines for capital construction for campuses. Um, so yes, I'm really happy that um, Rep McLaughlin just signed on to that bill as my house sponsor. So, um, and, that, and that idea was brought forward to me by a collection of, of institutions. Um, pretty much all institutions in the state um, have signed on other than CU because CU is already allowed to do it. <laughs> um, in addition to that, I'd like to um, weigh in on this. Uh, I have a couple of different um, higher education initiatives that I'm working on, uh, one of which is the departmental goal um, that they outlined in their uh, budget presentation to the Joint Budget Committee. And that's along the lines of um, looking at um, improving uh, services for post-secondary students with disabilities. So um, here we've done so much work around in the K-12 space around students with disabilities. You know, we, we started off this conversation talking about special education funding. Uh, we've talked a lot about making sure that those students who are at risk for um, things like uh, students who have dyslexia, for example, um, all of these types of, of uh, policy questions that we're debating in the K-12 space don't just go away when students transition into post-secondary uh, settings. So um, what this bill will do, and I'm very pleased it's going to be starting in the House, um, Representative Ortiz will be will be starting and kicking off the bill in the House, but we're going to do an assessment. We're going to bring to together all of the people in this space, the universities and colleges, uh, uh, people from the disability community, students that are affected by this, uh, parents, educators, all of the people that um, touch and, and interact and work in this space together to do an assessment of how well are we doing this? Are we actually supporting our students with disabilities in these post-secondary institutions and, and settings? And um, uh, we don't want to prescribe a solution uh, before we get an assessment of where we are. Um, so that's a, a bill that I'm very excited to be working about and to order to continue uh, uh, my work, my, my personal work, um, uh, supporting people with disabilities and our students um, with disabilities. So that's one thing. Um, also, I'm really pleased uh, just yesterday, uh, the 1330 task force just announced our recommendations for uh, workforce and post-secondary um, uh, initiatives. And this was a task force, a bill that I, I carried along with uh, Representative McCleskey in the House to formulate this, this task force to, to do a, a, a deep dive, to look at how can we come back from COVID? Do we just wanna go back to normal? Do we just wanna pretend like COVID didn't happen? 
Or do we wanna be responsive and use this as an opportunity to actually um, uh, take a big step forward in how we educate uh, our, our, our workforce and, and, and how we, we go about doing post-secondary education in Colorado? So are there ways that we can make um, better connections? Are there things that we need to be doing um, to, to make the space more relevant? Um, how do we talk to one another better? How do we do um, stackable credentials? How do we make post-secondary education more accessible and more affordable um, to all of our students, no matter what pathway they choose? Um, so uh, I'm very excited. Those recommendations just came out yesterday. There are no bills yet. Um, so these aren't bill ideas. Um, these are a list of recommendations that we hope will be taken up this session. Um, leadership has dedicated approximately $100 million towards this effort. So I'm really excited um, that we will be able to uh, put forward some ideas to, to be innovative in this space. Um, and then, so our last question before we move on to audience submitted questions, um, I just want to ask, you know, in Governor Polis's budget, it calls for a 1% increase to higher education funding. I wanted to see if that's enough to keep up with, um, you know, the demands out there, inflation and, and the financial burden that's uh, been placed on families. We've talked a lot about college yeah. affordability over the years. So should be more, more money be considered for higher ed? It's going to have to. Um, and I, I'm sorry to dominate the conversation here, but um, I'm really glad that you asked that question um, because I'm, I'm one of the advisors on the Colorado Commission for Higher Education. When we talked through the governor's um, budget proposal, what became very clear to me is that that amount um, that he is proposing is not enough to cover the mandatory expenses of, of our colleges and universities. Doesn't even cover uh, the the cost of, of living adjustment um, that our, our institutions um, have to, to carry forward, much less give them any room to deal with the extra burden of, of COVID um, and, and what uh, that impact has been to higher education. So um, it's it's definitely not enough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not even going to meet those minimum expectations. And then secondly, um, he's also saying, oh no, it's not that small because there are these other things that I'm also proposing, um, which inflates the, the, the amount, makes, makes it look bigger. So he's also taking um, as part of the package, the um, uh, proposal for capital construction or for some of these small uh, micro programs that are specific to a single institution or, or an initiative. Um, so uh, when you put the whole package together, it does seem on the surface as if, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a good amount for higher ed, but it's not uh, when you pick it apart and you see what is there for operating. And, and that's the aspect that I think definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, Senator if I may. Representative Larson, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. If, if I may jump in and then I apologize, I'll have to jump after my uh, comments here. Um, but, and this isn't necessarily specific to higher education, but it, I do think that it has come into this as we've seen across the country, uh, you know, inflation for the first time, frankly, in my lifetime is having a real time impact on, on, you know, operating costs. And that's not just hitting people at grocery stores, but it's also up at the higher ed level uh, and across the spectrum. And I do think that we're going to need to have a hard conversation and an honest conversation with our higher education institutions especially with what we've seen over the last two years with a lot of students you know, leaving. Uh, what is that gonna look like for those students carrying debt that does not have a uh, diploma attached to it, uh, carrying you know, a, a two or three year educational experience that maybe is a no longer a relevant career field. Um, so I think we're gonna have to have a, a really hard look at uh, what are we doing to integrate kind of CTE, um, you know, technical things. The, I'm glad that the Senator Zenzinger mentioned you know, layering credentials and really fundamentally reimagining the approach, not just this four-year bachelor's uh, degree assumption, but you know, how about you know, layering, going into a medical career field, starting off with an EMT certification, then an NP, uh, and then layering credentials on top of that, progressing through and thinking of education more as a lifetime experience than as a traditional 
you know, for your undergraduate. Um, and I think especially with, with inflation and the reality there, I think people are looking and saying, what is the value of this degree? Um, so, you know, when I, when I hear about these across the board increases, uh, you know, for, for institutions of higher education, I say, well, what, what is that for? If you're telling me that your operating costs went up, you know, is that because inflation happened or, you know, is there maybe ways that you can slim down administrative costs? Have you been internally looking and saying, hey, you know what, maybe this level of administration made sense pre-COVID, but now that we have a fundamentally different student body, and we're serving a fundamentally different purpose here. Do we need these same administrators? Are there ways to streamline? Um, and I think that that's something that we're going to need to look at with our higher our institutions of higher education, um, because I, you know, I think it's that was one area where price inflation was out of control before this. Uh, and given the, the current situation hitting the entire economy, I think there's going to be a real reckoning, and we're going to look at these cost inflated areas and say, you know, why has the cost risen this much over the last decade? Are we getting value? Uh, since my dollar no longer goes as far as it did a few months ago, am I going to go ahead and put this into higher education? Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying that to be the Grinch, but I just think it's a, it's a hard truth that we need to reckon with. Um, and we need to make sure that we're delivering value for the students that are making a gigantic financial investment. I mean, short of their mortgage, they will get on their home uh, college is the second largest financial investment that most people make is their education. Uh, and we need to make sure that they are leaving, making that huge investment that they are leaving with something that is increasing their earning potential um, and is really delivering them some tan something tangible. So, and with that, I hate to kind of do a mic drop moment, but uh, I do need to get going. Thank you again for having me. A great event. I am so sorry I couldn't uh, you know, give it my undivided attention, but I look forward to keep working working with you guys going forward. And thank you, everyone. Professor Larson, thank you so much for being here. Um, and before, before we end this, uh, Senator Zenzinger, I saw you shaking your head over there. So um, before we go to audience, I'll let you get a word in real quick. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I, I, I've been having a lot of conversations with um, our, our CEOs at the different institutions. And um, I, I, I was just reminded of a fantastic conversation that I had with Janine Davidson from uh, Metro. And I will tell you that um, our colleges and universities um, have already gone through the process of slimming down to the bone. <laughs> when we cut their funding um, at the height of COVID, uh, we cut their funding 58%. Unlike K-12, we restored all of the K-12 cuts last year. We did not restore the 58% that we cut from higher ed. So it, it has gone beyond just what kind of efficiencies can we account for. And, and to give you an example, the minimum amount uh, of money that our colleges and universities will need in order to cover their mandatory expenses. So these are the cost of living adjustments that we've already passed. Uh, this is the, the cost of healthcare, <laughs> uh, these kinds of things. Um, the, the contracted, negotiated um, salaries um, that have already passed, um, they're going to need 120 million. And what is being proposed is 47. So we are well outside of, of the wow. range of the amount of resources that we're going to need in order for the, our, our post-secondary institutions just to operate, um, to operate much less achieve all of the fantastic goals that we have in our Colorado Rises plan. Thank you so much, everyone, for answering our questions. Now we'll turn to the audience questions and Olivia uh, will kick those off. Thank you to Nicole for our next audience question. Uh, Senator Buckner, Senator Lundin, and Representative McLaughlin, many educators are at a breaking point. The Colorado Education Association has surveyed educators recently and shows that two out of three Colorado educators are considering changing careers. This is incredibly worrisome for our students and Colorado's futures. What will this committee be considering and how to retain and recruit educators who may be questioning remaining or entering this profession? Um, we had a bill last year that addressed some of this. Um, you know, to give teachers um, more space, more time. But I think it all boils down to, we need to pay them what they deserve. Um, I, I'm looking at this this year. Um, we had Representative Wilson um, in the house for many years. 
Um, he was a former superintendent, a big advocate of public education. And every year that he was in there, he had a bill about how we need to do full day kindergarten, put it right out in front and the education committees always passed it. And then the finance people said, we can't afford it. Well, he got that done after um, many years in the legislature. And I think we need to start doing that um, in different ways with the budget stabilization factor. We need to keep telling people how much we owe, how much we owe, how much we owe. It's a lot of money right now. And um, none of us would loan somebody money in 2008 and not expect it to be paid back by 2021. Um, we, would have to, we would demand that they pay us. I think we need to look at all aspects. Um, I'm always glad to hear that people are running bills like this, but uh, we need to make sure that we have sustainable funding for schools that doesn't raise taxes. How do we do that? We need to make sure that um, people aren't assuming that this one-time money that we have is going to um, get rid of the budget stabilization factor because we can give teachers a raise one year and then they won't get it the next year because um, it's one-time money. We don't have that much. So we need to be, um, I think a lot of people are working on bills that um, will kind of navigate what we have to do for teachers. But I think one way to keep teachers in is to show them our appreciation. And you can't offer them affordable housing um, and very little salary and then still say that we appreciate you. Teachers don't go into this career for money. Trust me, I know that one. But, um, but they would like to be respected and they were the essential workers during all this pandemic. Um, they had to sit there all the time. They had kids of their own at home and they were trying to be a teacher and a mother and a father and um, everything at once. And it was really, really difficult. I think we owe them um, the respect that money would show and a raise and that we are really, we are, we're going through and funding our schools once and for all and finish up with this, um, this thing that happened in 2008 or nine or whenever that was that, um, that said, we're gonna borrow money from you for a little while and we'll pay it back and they haven't, we have not. And uh, it's a collective we on this one. So that's kind of what I'm thinking on this. So Jason, I'll dive in next. Um, so it's not just a problem in public education. It's a societal problem. Um, anybody who's picked up a newspaper I'll explain it's a piece of paper where they put word. No, a bad joke about nobody reads newspapers anymore. <laughs> Anybody who reads media has read about the great resignation. We've got people across all platforms, across all sectors, across all of society choosing to opt out. They're saying, I'm going to step out and move on. That's a part of the challenge we have as a society. It hurts us, especially in public education, is because as I've spoken before, nothing's more important than in fact, the future of our children and the education that they get. We've got some structural problems and it goes back to, we were talking about um, um, the finance formula and where the money goes at the very, very beginning of this panel discussion. Um, the reality is a significant amount, up to a quarter of the operating budget of all of our school districts goes into the retirement program for teachers and folks who have come and gone, uh, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, gardeners, folks who are participating in the Public Employees Retirement Association, we spend an enormous amount, up to a quarter of our current operating budget paying for that. So that's a structural problem. I have said from day one, State Board of Education 11 years ago, the golden triangle of education, an enthusiastic student, an engaged parent, an exceptional teacher. Pay the teachers more. I've said that year after year after year after year. I could not agree with Rep. McLaughlin more, but I'm a little more focused. I'm not pay everybody associated with the education industrial complex more. I'm about pay the student facing teachers more. Let's be really specific and let's really support the professionals who are right there in the nexus of that child's ability to gain. And there's a lot of support that goes on around that. And we need to acknowledge that as well, but focus the money on those student facing teachers. Now, as I said earlier, I'm gonna be bringing a bill, it's my pre-file that says, let's eliminate the budget stabilization factor. Let's get rid of it altogether and let's provide greater flexibility 
for the benefit of all the students of Colorado. So it's, it's a societal problem. We should do things about it within public education. But quite frankly, public education has some really serious structural financial problems that we need to be addressing as well. Thank you both for those answers. Um, we will now move on to a question from Natalie. So could Senator Buckner please share some of the logistical specifics for universal pre-K? Specifically, what provisions are there for ensuring adequate classroom space and well-trained and ensuring that there are also well-trained ECE educators? Yes. Um, Natalie, you may not like my answer, but I just have to be totally honest and upfront with you. We are still working on all the logistics with this bill. As you know, uh, this won't go into effect until 2023. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, one thing I want everyone to remember that this is a big complex process. It's not going to happen overnight. Change is not easy. And we have to have patience right now as we're working on how we are going to implement this program. Um, some of these ideas might take a few years for providers to meet the bar uh, because it's a high bar. So we're being very realistic about this. It's not going to happen overnight. So I can't really answer your question right now and I'm not trying to evade it, but we're just not to that point yet. And as we move forward, I will be able to give you more information. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, someone asked about a mixed delivery system, and I'm so glad that um, Senator Lundeen brought this up because we know that a mixed delivery system is really important because it's going to support, it's going to give more support for family choices because everybody's needs are different and everybody's, uh, everybody's household is different. So the mixed delivery system is something that we will be working on, but it's going to take time. And the expectations I know right now are, are really high, but please know that we're still in the beginning phases. And as soon as we uh, release more information, it'll be made known to the public. This next question is from Terry. What legislation do you anticipate on either side of the issue with respect to critical race theory? Um, I would like to start us out with Senator Lundeen, but then it's open for anyone to answer. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I think that it's incredibly important that we all accept and understand each other for the human being we are. And to, to define an individual um, outside of who they are as an individual by tossing them into one category or another is absolutely inappropriate. And I, I think that is a fundamental um, uh, precept of who we are as Americans in an experiment that seeks to get to a better place every day, every week, every year as, as a society, as a group of people. Um, I um, had done some reading and had spent some time interacting with some folks who have a curriculum specifically built on the writings and the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think that that particular curriculum is an incredibly important way to address some of these questions that are popping up. So um, I, I, I think it's important that we each see and respect each other as an individual human being. And we should never say to someone, you are, um, you are uh, su subjugated or you are superior based on a characteristic other than who you are as a human being. I have one quick thing to say. <laughs> um, critical race theory is not taught in high schools. It's a law school class. And uh, we used to call it American history. So I'm not sure why they changed the name and why they're saying that if we're talking about history and there's factual history out there, that's what we're learning. So. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin. I was just going to say the same thing. Um, this is taught in law school. Um, this topic has exploded this year. And I, I, I think we just need to understand that this is a topic and it's um, unfortunately, it's pitting people against each other. 
And just like Senator Lundeen said, understanding all of our dis differences is so crucial, but it's really a shame that we're pitting each other, pitting, uh, pitting this against each other and there needs to be more understanding, but um, it's, 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 it's probably a topic that's going to take more discussion than we have today. But uh, Representative McLaughlin hit the nail on the head uh, with her explanation of it. And it's not, it's not being taught in schools right now. Uh, and it's, it's really unfortunate that it has gotten to this point. I've received lots of calls about this in my school district Cherry Creek Schools, I represent Cherry Creek Schools and Aurora Public Schools and critical race theory is not being taught in the schools right now. I'm really sad that it's a misunderstanding. And I will also point out that from a state perspective, the state is in charge of standards. Our local school boards are in charge of curriculum. So if you, you, know, you wanna talk about how history is taught or, or what, kinds of curriculum um, that you want to teach uh, history, that's a local control issue. Um, what the state does is we set the standards um, for all students to meet throughout the state. And oh, by the way, those social studies standards are going through a review process this year. <laughs> so if we have any content expert specialists, uh, this is your moment. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Thank you all for those answers. Uh, we'll go on to a question from William, and this is to open in to any of you to answer. Is there movement to provide further support for dyslexia in our schools? Ideally, funding to train reading interventionists and structured literacy and possibly diagnostics at the district level to help families access timely reading support and diagnoses for dyslexia and related disorders. Well, I, I don't want to jump in because I don't have any legislation specifically around dyslexia, and I'm not aware if any of my other colleagues are bringing any bills forward. I know that um, Senator Buckner has worked very closely uh, with um, several advocacy groups in this space, um, but I will just from a high level uh, mention two things. One, if we fully fund our special education system, think about what we could do <laughs> in, 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 by way of screening and, 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 and additional supports and one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, assistance. So um, I think that there's some value uh, that could be had there. And then secondly, um, we did a little rewrite of the READ Act a few years ago. And part of that um, had to do with those literacy grants and um, a, a framework that was really built around using best practices. And so um, I, I think that um, schools and districts that are taking advantage of some of those grant programs to reinvigorate their curriculum could have an opportunity here to uh, find um, a, a curriculum that, that could better suit the needs of all students, including um, those students with dyslexia or other reading challenges. Um, so, um, without getting into any specifics about legislation um, that may or may not be out there. I've not heard of any, um, but that doesn't preclude a bill from coming forward. Um, I'll just say personally, I'm not carrying uh, any bill, uh, but I'm very, very laser-like focused on um, getting our special education funding up to where it should be. I haven't heard about any specific bills for dyslexia this coming year. I have run legislation in the past that was supported by everyone in the um, uh, in the in the different chambers, uh, but I haven't heard about anything specific this year. Um, it's really dyslexia. My daughter is uh, is is dyslexic, and she's an educator, and we talk about this constantly. And there's definitely more room. There's there's more room for work in this area. But I don't think there are any specific bills coming this year, but it will be on our radar. This question is for Mark. Massive federal investment in the past years has brought billions to the state and districts. Any legislation in the works to evaluate the effective use of these funds? And this question is open to anyone. I think 
all federal funds comes with strings attached to it. And, and part of that um, requires a certain level of accountability. Um, so uh, I don't think we just get the money without being able to demonstrate that we're using it for its specific purpose and that it's being used effectively. Um, whether or not we act on those results, however, I think is still an open question. <laughs> so um, I, I know that recently um, a, a lot of those funds were very specific to COVID um, mm -hmm. and, and just trying to get through um, all of the challenges that come with, with making sure that we have safe spaces for our, our kids to learn. Um, but other federal dollars, I mean, we I'm still waiting on the federal dollars for, for special education. We were promised a, a specific amount from the federal government to support our special needs kids, and we haven't gotten it. So um, uh, to that end, um, I, I wish that we were receiving more, more money from the feds for that purpose. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll get, I think we have time for maybe two more. Um, so let's hear this question from Kevin. Um, how are legislators going to make sure uh, education becomes a viable long-term career choice? Can you repeat that question again? again? Um, so the question from Kevin is, how are legislators going to make sure that education, being an educator, becomes a viable long-term career choice? Well, I'm a teacher. <laughs> and uh, during the interim, um, I worked as a substitute teacher. And I will tell you that um, this was probably the most challenging environment that I have ever experienced or seen. Um, uh, there does come a, a point where you know, you can't just continue doing something because you love teaching if you can't survive, if you can't pay your bills, if you can't buy a home, you know, if you can't even qualify for buying a home. Um, so uh, I, I think that um, we do absolutely need to look at educator pay. I, I think it's just one of the, the big driving factors. Um, if you're going to shell out a lot of money to uh, get your degree so that you can be a teacher, um, we don't want those educators to be strapped with um, a lifetime of debt because they chose to use their degree by educating young minds. You know, We need those educators, um, absolutely. And so, um, I, I think it's an exceptionally rewarding profession, but I think educators are getting a little tired of not being respected for the work that they do. So along with increasing teacher pay, I think we have to start affording educators the respect that they deserve. And part of that is bringing educators to the table um, and actually listening to them. Um, we do, I, I don't deny that every single person on this call and, 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 I, and I truly in my heart of hearts believe that all of the legislators that are talking today are, are working their hardest to do what they believe is best for education. Um, that being said, I think that we do sometimes end up in our legislator bubble and we don't really truly listen to what our educators need um, and, and what they're saying. Um, so uh, that that's what I would say that we need to do is increase teacher pay, start affording our educators more respect, and then bring them to the table and start listening um, so that we can all work on these things together. So, We're out of time, so I'll say ditto. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, I'll throw in a couple of additional thoughts. Um, I, I think that uh, you, you've heard me say it on this call. You've heard me say it a dozen times. Um, enthusiastic, student engaged parent and exceptional teacher. There are a few things as valuable um, in terms of changing society, changing a person's life as a great educator. Um, so we need to allow them to be treated and respected as the professionals they are. Disappointingly, I will tell you, um, um, I have supported a number of bills that would have allowed exceptional teachers to be paid more. 
And every time the teachers union has knocked them down. When confronted, I asked the head of the teachers union, is there any circumstance in which a more highly effective teacher should be paid more? And the head of the teachers union said, no, they all do the same job. I could not disagree more. The way you keep teachers in the game, the way you give great educators the headroom they need is you allow them to be the professionals they are and you reward them as they demonstrate their excellence. So it's a challenging, big conversation, but that is my starting point. And I respect and honor the perspectives my colleagues bring as well. But I think we need to think about it differently and treat those incredible, incredibly valuable individuals who can transform a person's life and our society as the professionals they are. I agree. Um, one of the conversations that I've had consistently for the last two years is teachers go into teaching and education because of their love of that, uh, the love for that career, mm -hmm. just as I did. But when I see my teachers having to work at Chipotle or other places to make ends meet, that is very difficult for them how can you be a great teacher and concentrate if you can't pay your bills? So we have to come up with some type of solution. So hopefully we can put all of our great minds together and find a solution because they don't feel respected, they don't feel honored, and they are stressed out. So we have to do something. So we need to keep this conversation going and band together to make a difference. Thank you all so much for your time. I thought we would have time for one more question, but I was wrong. And so unfortunately we'll have to wrap right here, but thank you so much for, for all of your insights today. And thank you so much to Olivia. You were a phenomenal co-moderator and I just appreciate you being Great here. Good job, Olivia. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and also a big thank you to our event partner, the Mortgage College of Education at the University in Denver and special thanks to our event sponsor, the Colorado so Education Association. And last, thank you to all of you who are in attendance today. Uh, we hope you found this helpful and informative. Before I let you go, uh, we have a survey that you can find in the chat bar um, that'll take about two minutes. And if you can fill this out, uh, it'll help us better our events into the future. So, and everyone have a great day and thank you so much. Thank you, Chalk B. Bye-bye.